I'm here at the home of Alex Brown in Hopkinton. Uh, I should probably be outside because that's as much of his home I understand. I'm uh, beside some beautiful things from nature, likely the walks he has taken with wife Polly. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Alex has to say today about his love of the earth and his work in science and the messages he has to share beyond. Alex, thank you for having us in your home this morning um, for Meet Your Neighbor to talk about your life a bit and your work and your interests uh, and experiences in life. It's a uh, wintry field day in mid-March now and from the conversations I've had with you, uh, I know that you care deeply about the earth. That is part of a large part of who you are from my understanding and the first question I have is what brought you in who you are and your experiences to Hopkinton to come and live? Well as uh, I've told you I, um, I was um, uh, in technology in the, in the technology industry for many years and uh, um, we came to uh, um, the Boston area in the uh, early 80s mm -hmm. and um, I uh, had uh, come for a job at Data General Corporation mm -hmm. in Westboro and uh, we were looking around for uh, a place to live and eventually discovered Hopkinton mm -hmm. and um, all of its wood, woods and, and fields mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and uh, we came to this place. This this house is uh, one of the few that we could afford, <laughs> and uh, the uh, um, location is, is convenient for mm. uh, commute to Westboro. Mm. It is. It's a charming location, nestled yeah. on a little side street, private, and surrounded by woods in a way. And um, I was already. Uh, uh, cycling mm -hmm. and um, was able to get to, to Westboro by bicycle. Oh, every day? For a while. Uh, in the summer for a uh -huh. while, yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. not, not, uh, not daily, but um, it was a wonderful part of the, the part of living here. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I felt uh, like this was a very good choice and we mm -hmm. ended up um, staying here for going on 35 years now. Wow, uh -huh. that's quite a long time yeah. to be here yeah. uh, in Hopkinton and, and good for as the town. Newcomers. Uh -huh. <laughs> as you know, newcomers. We st still feel like folks from away, from um, hmm. uh, the, in, in the way that um, visitors to Maine end up being visitors no matter how many years they yes. stay there. Yeah. But I would say, I think you, uh, you and your wife Polly are rather famous in Hopkinton, not only for the things you do, but uh, seeing you on the streets of Hopkinton often. Uh, you are on the main streets and you're on the back trails in the woods. Uh, that You are really known as outdoor people of Hopkinton. I well, walking is one of the, the great gifts of living here. It's, mm -hmm. it's really mm -hmm. part of the, the, the um, wonderful experience of, uh, of the town mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we, we live very close to the trailhead of the center trail mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, uh, very frequently walk all the way down to uh, um, the high school grounds and, mm -hmm. and beyond mm -hmm. in summer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a real, um, a, a real joy to be living here mm -hmm. still yeah. after all these years. This mm -hmm. always surprises. That is uh, such an important message. I think uh, people come to this town, other towns, for different reasons. You know, schools, uh, housing, distance of work. Um, but uh, to really, uh, for it to resonate, how important it is to be to the close to the beauty of our our land, our nature. Yes. Uh, uh, that is important to be heard. I think more and more as we go forward in our evolving. Um, so 
thank you for saying that, and and thank you for being famous walking around <laughs> outside. What would you say? I can't that, imagine why I'm so famous. <laughs> well, because I, I think different people uh, talk about seeing you on the streets. I mean it in that way. I don't mean oh, you know. Okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, there's Alex and Polly, and then I I hear that you are out at nighttime sometimes in the moonlight walking and the trails and Hopkinton State Park. What would you say is one of your favorite places in Hopkinton in the outdoors? Well, we like the, the places that are closest. Yeah, so you can walk. We can uh, easily walk to uh, the, uh, the cemetery mm -hmm. with, you know, not more than a few minutes um, morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and we like to take people there when uh, visitors pop, at, mm -hmm. pop in. And um, what would you discover there at the cemetery? Well, we find um, the um, citizens of Hopkinton who who died about the time of the Civil War, ah. and, mm -hmm. and there are some uh, some older mm -hmm. graves there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real education yeah. to uh, find. Uh, the you know recognizable waves of immigration and mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, population change to uh, be registered there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Hopkinton, of course, was an industrial town, mm -hmm. um, a shoe factory town, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, important people in the town were not only the uh, the businessmen owning the factories, but <laughs> the uh, businesses serving those factories with transport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so yeah. uh, the, uh, um, all of those things show up in the, in the history of the town. Mm -hmm. And having a, t a history uh, of the town itself has been really delightful and important to us. Yeah. And we feel identified with Hopkinton as part of the the later history um, as relatively l recent arrivals mm -hmm. and uh, uh, recent enough that we're not, uh, we haven't acquired any, any uh, land, we had never owned a field here, mm -hmm. but fields what, uh, were what uh, drew us here and, and uh, keep us here, I think. We remember the fields down the hill from our house on Wood Street as uh, uh, open bare um, land mm -hmm. and um, uh, saw them filling up with uh, not exactly tract housing but it's uh, it's been a big change over mm -hmm. those those 30 years yeah. and it's still going on mm -hmm. I understand that part of your life was spent living in a yurt <laughs> and I feel like that is very relevant to what you're doing and who you are in the circle of your life. Well, I'm not, but okay. <laughs> I think that is an admirable thing. I think we need to learn from that uh, and think more deeply about the importance of being connected and living closely to the land. We are getting farther and farther away from that. What, uh, what could you tell? I, you built the yurt, right? Well, the, the, the whole project was um, a, a part of my um, first departure from the uh, technology industry, really, from my first job at IBM in New York State. And um, um, the, uh, uh, let's see how to say this, the, um, the fact of the matter was that, that uh, we did not have a lot of money and, mm -hmm. and uh, we had to figure out some way to, to uh, live as, uh, as freely as possible. I think that's amazing and I, I think that might be more and more of our stories eventually. Well, we were not alone. There were you know, other many, many other people uh -huh. find, trying to find um, a, uh, a secret pathway uh, through the fields and woods of their, uh -huh. of their uh, um, homes and, uh -huh. and neighborhoods. And for those who don't know, a yurt is a wooden and canvas structure like a tent, a triangular tent 
to live outside, and it's very warm, right? You had a wood stove in right. it. It was it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. We lived through um, several winters in upstate New York. Whoa. And then, a lot of snow a and lot of cold, snow, yeah. and you were fine, uh, yeah, relatively yeah. Uh, yeah. with challenges. You probably wood dealt stove with. and uh, and uh, kerosene lamps yeah. for light, which means you uh, had to have sensibility about how to yeah. make that work and not have uh, and our, fire. Our sole electrical appliance was battery radio. <laughs> wow, uh -huh. that is amazing. I would love to hear more about that yeah. uh, for a different library talk maybe. Yeah. In addition to all these different ways you contribute into the world and a part of it, and then you get the balance by walking out in nature, but you have music in your life too. And I'm right. aware, I have heard the uh, suggestion that our in our very early uh, civilization that perhaps humans brought music into the world because of the sounds they heard from nature that they were inspired to bring through the art of what they could create um, and so it doesn't surprise me that you make right. beautiful music as well right well I play French horn which is uh, um, I think one of the, the most remarkable um, uh, experience uh, achievements of technology huh. in yeah. music mm -hmm. oh, I saw it. it looks very complex with the keys there and the little um, the musical metal. instruments of the 17th century were among the highest uh, technology of the huh. era interesting yeah and so you've been playing it since you were a child since since I was a youngster yeah yes wow and you uh, the horn that I showed you yeah. is, is uh, just about 50 years old. 50 years old, and it's a beautiful piece of an instrument. And uh, you rehearse every day, pretty much? No. No, okay. <laughs> Wish you I want to. <laughs> yes, I should. And you perform as part of... I'm um, a, a horn player in the uh, UMass Medical School ah, I've heard about orchestra. that, yes. Uh -huh. The Seven Hill Symphony is the name of the ensemble. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Excuse me, and um, uh, we are made up of uh, um, faculty and students hmm. yeah. at the the uh, medical school, and uh, community people oh. in the in the region. That's a wonderful. We're really a regional or orchestra. So it is clear that you are a deep-hearted environmentalist uh, connected to the earth and you are uh, you are interested in history and you are a scientist working at data general and beyond well I wouldn't call that a, a technology job data general it was a uh, um, computer company in the uh, uh, third wave really of the industry mm. It um, was successful with a, uh, a line of, of uh, business-oriented computers mm -hmm. and uh, uh, relatively successful in the 1980s. Yeah. Um, but that was also the time of the rise of the uh, PC and offices, mm -hmm. and yeah. the industry changed completely when mm -hmm. that uh, took place. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I considered... Uh, um, working independently on my own as a software engineer, um, building office products for the uh, the uh, new PC industry, but um, that really wasn't what I'd learned to do. What I'd been doing at Data General, I was a, a scientific systems programmer at Cornell, where mm -hmm. I. Uh, was previously employed and uh, um, well that sounds like a uh, impressive and perplexing title to me perhaps what does that mean it's perplexing to me <laughs> too because I can't uh -huh. I can't point it at one um, specialization within mm -hmm. the the uh, general field of scientific computing that uh, that sticks out and expertise for that matter either mm -hmm. um, the uh, the way I got into the industry is, is also a little bit odd. Um, and when I was in undergraduate school at uh, Cornell, mm -hmm. um, I decided to go ahead and take a course in um, computing to find out 
how, uh, how it was used on that campus mm -hmm. um, because I'd, I'd been interested myself earlier um, and brought some experience from high school mm -hmm. as, as well. Grew up in Washington, D.C. Ah, I was wondering. Yeah. Okay. In the midst, uh, in the city? 60s, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, well, that and was an interesting time to be there. Yeah. Um, the uh, campus was uh, um, learning to uh, accommodate um, computing as a, as a major part of the engineering curriculum. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had uh, a uh, IBM mainframe computer. Uh, in, during the time we were undergraduates, Paul and I were undergraduates together at Cornell. Okay, and that's that, where you met. That's where mm -hmm. we met, and um, I uh, hadn't been thinking about uh, working with computers, but uh, hmm. uh, it became pretty obvious that was, that was the most valuable asset that I took away from from Cornell. I was interested in in physical science research and um, had some ambitions to, uh, to uh, work in uh, an observatory, an astro astronomical observatory, or uh, um, some other physics facility, and uh, mm -hmm. none of that ever happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. I never got close enough to faculty to uh, get early experience in related fields. And, but sometimes it happens in other ways, not directly through profession, but, uh, yeah, but walking the, in Hopkinton and looking up at the stars. Well, you don't meet too many physicists that way. <laughs> no? Some you do, yes, it's true. Uh -huh, yeah. Well, and um, yeah, um, so there at Cornell. Um, and, uh, so I'm explaining how we came to, uh, to Massachusetts. Okay. Mm -hmm. We were really... Um, not interested in, in urban life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After coming from it in two places. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And um, the world was obviously uh, changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the most important thing that, that uh, we were looking for at that time was uh, 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 calm, peace, and quiet, and mm -hmm. certain amount of stability. Mm -hmm. So that is, in, in fact, what we moved to Hopkinton to try to find, and um, I think we succeeded pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, the whole period was uh, surrounded with uh, my uncertainty about what uh, uh, emerged as as a career in. Uh, computing industry. I had some experience with scientific, with technical engineering applications, but not enough to be a big name or mm -hmm. recognizable figure in any any indi industri industry or sector of the industry. And um, uh, when I came here, I was uh, they didn't really know what to do with me at Data General. Mm -hmm. They had some engineering markets, but uh, nothing very, very prominent. Um, so coming here, I, I was at the home office for Data General, and I was um, able to uh, work for the company as a as a uh, systems engineer, in other words, a fix-it guy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, a room full of fix-it guys whose jobs were mostly on the phone, uh -huh. yeah. and we worked with uh, field system engineers who visited customers and talked to them about problems and tried mm. to solve them. Well, it's an important part of the system. And it gives you a, a breadth of view of, yeah. their, of their market, their industry as a whole. You look mm. at their competitors in, in that kind of situation. You're, mm. you're serving as the expert uh, advice mm -hmm. to um, sales and marketing people and uh, all of these were interesting uh, to an extent but data general was really not an engineering company mm. uh, it was uh, for, founded by engineers and uh, 
successful through uh, the um, somewhat innovative uh, um, products that they produced, but they were they were an also ran in the mini computer industry at that time, and um, they were never going to be number one in anything. Mm -hmm. that, but you were part of this system. But it was nevertheless a national company, national right. organization, mm -hmm. worldwide, in fact. And they had uh, a few significant markets in Europe mm -hmm. um, and in Latin America as well as the U.S. Um, so when you step back and you look at it, it's all an important part of our civilization. Big. Yeah, it and was a big time for, for those kinds of companies in that industry. Mm -hmm. I know uh, we have limited time, so I guess I'd Sorry. like to jump, oh no, no, um, to the fact that now, uh, many years later, here you are, and I heard the term problem solving that you did at your work, and you are working on behalf of the planet now, <laughs> I think, for problem solving by an upcoming talk at the library that you're giving. So what I'm offering uh, at the Hopkinson Library is a, um, a not just this this initial um, meeting to discuss the, the the basics and the possibilities for for discussion, but actually to begin um, um, open set of discussions among people who are um, concerned and familiar with the the, the climate change that's happening around us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Every day, I mean, the uh, the weather we're sitting yeah, here. That's right. Uh, the wild storm we just had. Exactly. Yeah. So even well, though this is a, a a snow event, this is very definitely yeah. part of the climate mm -hmm. that that uh, uh, we're observing changing around us. Wow. So um, the uh, the details of of that that uh, climate science are modest. It's not a lot of science. It's not difficult science. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, high schoolers mm -hmm. and, um, and um, young people uh, with really any level of, okay. of science education at all could easily understand and participate in, okay. in discussion about that. Well, in particular, they can understand what this is going to, to mean for the rest of our lives. Yeah. The, the fact that carbon dioxide is such an important part of the story is uh, going to change the uh, um, lives of these young people in um, important and, and sudden ways. They are going to discover that their car, for example, is no longer legal mm. when it becomes impossible to put that much CO2 from, from vehicles right. into the atmosphere mm -hmm. without any restriction whatsoever. Right. That's going to have to stop, and mm -hmm. it's going to have to stop fairly soon. Yeah. Um, the businesses, the industries that we, that we work in are similarly going to change sharply. Hmm. A lot of our economic environment is based on the uh, ability of fossil fuel uh, engines to provide transportation and, and um, manufacturing. Um, and um, that's going to have to change very, very rapidly. So there is a, a lot of change ahead for young people, but also for yeah. us old timers. And what is one thing, maybe as we end this conversation, uh, that you think is utmost uh, importance for us to uh, be thinking about be, uh, as we move forward? Uh, the thing that's probably closest and uh, and most uh, immediate for for Americans is to um, um, think about their their own personal vehicles. Mm -hmm. We will all continue to drive cars that with gasoline engines for some time, but that's going to have to stop. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are solutions for replacement with electric vehicles. There is a lot of resistance in many ways among, for all of us because it's so different 
to deal with batteries that have to be charged instead of a tank that needs to be filled. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we have to learn how to change our lives and change our, our transportation patterns in particular in order to um, work with those new um, constraints on how we power our cars and, and, uh, and other vehicles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most immediate thing. Yeah. Beyond that, there are, are uh, things about uh, heating and, and cooling of our homes. There are uh, many other things that, which will change what kinds of industries uh, are around us and where we're, how we're able to work and be paid. So the, uh, I th it sounds the, like you should write a book. The reach of the topic is enormous. <laughs> yes, yes. I gather that, and I know we're just about out of time now, and we are fortunate to have you caring so deeply in all your work over time, coming to this point of educating and uh, telling from your observations from that moment of time that you were meant maybe to study climate control and then to bring this talk forward and wake us up. So thank you for this good work. It is very important, and I uh, hope that it resonates and goes forward because it's about all of us. Do you have what it takes? Will you make a difference? Always an adventure. Police and fire working together. Utilizing the latest technology. Do you have what it takes? <laughs>